Welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to, to share with you about uh, what SWOM has been doing in the past three years or so. So I will be covering three things. One is about the science itself, and then um, along the line of, of implementing or doing science, we do a lot of capacity building and trying to outreach the, the stakeholders. So, um, but I think it's, it's good to, to recap the history of SWOM. Uh, which was uh, originally, uh, it's a bit difficult to, to call, it's called TwinCam, which is quite an engine, but uh, anyway, SWOM is, is better rooted. So we, we've uh, been covering two important wetland ecosystems, basically, which are peatlands and mangrove, but I, today I would like to cover and specializing to look at the, the mangrove only. And uh, the title sounds like mangrove can, can do something with regard to climate change, both adaptation and mitigation. We've been trying very hard to provide uh, credible information to policymakers related to wetlands, including mangrove, in the context of climate change, adaptation and mitigation. So with that in mind, we try to design the, the objective of the program by looking at various aspects like uh, assessing the carbon stock in this ecosystem, the dynamic of the flux, and sequestration of the greenhouse gases, and then try to model that and look at for broader uh, perspective, broader scale. And uh, we've been working in a quite a bit of, covering a bit of countries, uh, 24 countries now we are working in, uh, five in Africa, uh, 13 in Asia, and um, six in Latin America. So we, we were surprised by ourselves because when we did this, basically we, we tried to reach out uh, research institutions or universities so that we can have the trickle down effect of the activities. Especially when we run the activities like training at regional level, it will be attended by many countries so we can count the number of institutions, the number of countries. So we ended up with 24 now as, as we speak. The project is run uh, by the, the core fund mainly from the USID, but we managed to leverage a number of activities uh, using the, the core fund. So what, what we achieve in terms of science, um, I think my, my conversation will be uh, oriented towards in this, in this situation especially, I think it's, it's quite appropriate to say, does money matter for science? When we started off, we begin with 75,000 to, to start with, and we do very uh, hard kind of science in terms of data collection, hard data, and then we manage to publish it in, in nature, nature Geoscience, and that's, that's the beginning of the uh, activities because once it was published in 2011, um, I think it's about 6%, uh, top 6% quoted uh, article in the nature family and top 2% in nature geoscience. So we were very proud about it, but again, very busy to entertain you know, questions and uh, the trickle down effect of this publication. What we uh, discover really is very interesting because uh, mangroves store so much carbon and uh, not surprisingly, but we kind of stagger about the, the, the fact that most of them are stored below the ground in the soil. Uh, while looking at the, the shape of these trees, this stand is very tiny, but they have very high what we call uh, net primary production, and they deposited the, the biomass and uh, carbon in the soil. And with that special shape and structure of root system, the uh, deposits stay there for a long time. And 80% of something like 1,000 to 1,500 ton per hectare is stored in the soil. So what does it mean uh, in terms of uh, development, uh, the, the challenge is quite uh, significant when people trying to convert mangrove 
uh, and excavate the soil, that's, that's the, the beginning of destruction in terms of carbon storage. So we bring this message with numbers, with uncertainties, with you know, all this uh, confidence level, everything in the, in the policy community. And we've got the attention. The first uh, attraction that we start to harvest was from the UNFCCC. They have a meeting called uh, Workshop on the Ecosystem with High Carbon Reservoir, which is not in the UNFCCC agenda item, meaning that it's been neglected for quite a long time. And we made a very uh, statement about this important ecosystem in terms of climate change adaptation and mitigation. And now it's becoming a, a document called information document in the UNFCCC that you know body of work, various institutions, various capacity has been built across the globe, especially in the tropic. And we interact with the uh, negotiator in the substa meeting about the findings and I believe they are trying to, to work it out because at the same time uh, the IPCC, this is the, the scientific body of climate change uh, group that, is, that was requested or invited by the UNFCCC to develop a methodology especially to looking at wetlands and we are involved in that uh, process. Five uh, swarm participants or swarm members, uh, the, the main authors of this guideline which was published this year. And the request of to, trying to understand this methodology is staggering. I mean, every time we go to places like India, Costa Rica, and then Dominican Republic, Indonesia, we are asked how to use this guideline at national level. So we continue with the capacity building. Again, mainly we work with university research institution. And we, we believe that this is a good investment for the long term kind of thing. Because if you work with university, they have the capacity, people, and facilities to, to continue this. And I think it's also appropriate to discuss if C4 in the future is trying to build the capacity, I think one of the important partners is university. And we can leverage a lot of things through this project. Right now we have USAID peer program, that's, that's very, the very thing that we, we try to encourage our partners to, to submit proposal because we are not eligible to do that. So instead of uh, signing a contract with us, they can sign the contract with USAID right away. And we are, we are their collaborators. So what is next in terms of uh, theory of change, in terms of impact pathway? Along this line, we've been thinking very hard how to uh, basically able to measure the impact of the project. So we, we've been working, in addition to the, the global uh, community like UNFCCC and IPCC, we work with uh, government, uh, national government like India, Indonesia, and many others, uh, especially to try to implement the, the IPCC guideline and the numbers they are expecting from this research. So by engaging policy community, by engaging scientific, uh, local scientific community, that, that is the very uh, fashion we, we try to implement when we are thinking of the theory of change, the impact pathway. Uh, only last week, we are invited by the Indonesian uh, Red Plus Agency uh, to look at the possibility of integrating coastal carbon in the national red policy. So we, we are tasked, what I mean by we, C4, and, and the uh, partners that we've been working with, uh, to develop a policy paper where uh, coastal carbon can be part of the red uh, mechanism in Indonesia. We are also trying to fill up the gaps because swarm, the A is adaptation. We've been neglecting this 
for quite some time for a reason because the, the funding agency only concentrating on the mitigation. But we believe we can bundle the adaptation at the same time and, and we have the very uh, uh, issue that, that can uh, facilitate that because uh, in the coastal zone, mangrove play a very important role in coping with sea level rise and that's adaptation basically. You know, without saying this is adaptation project, we do measure carbon, we do measure the uh, sedimentation rate and, and, and the position of carbon. But at the same time, we're also looking at how this ecosystem cope with the increasing sea level, cope with very erratic uh, waves, etc. So we, we've been deploying equipments now to see how this ecosystem in various settings including the frames, those which are in the coastal, right in front of open sea and in, in the interior like uh, riverine and, and uh, estuarine will uh, respond to the change. So it's very interesting challenge for the, the future of uh, swarm. Now we are entering the third year and we just heard that our third year funding is secure. So we, we have a breathing space to, to look at this more seriously while working with this, the partners. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Daniel. I think that you've highlighted the, the importance of mangroves, a very much under-researched um, area of the ecosystem, forestry ecosystem. Um, and I think C4 is really at the cutting edge, thanks to you and your team, of, of that research. So questions, uh, comments, Daniel? Terry is right. The North Pole is researched better than, than mangrove. So, uh, yeah, that's the finding. Thanks, Terry. Thanks, Pat Daniel. It's very interesting uh, presentations and also uh, it's quite a uh, breakthrough, I guess, in C4 because you start talking about mangrove. Uh, my question is technically, uh, what is your strategy to engage with the Indonesian government, with the Ministry of Forestry, Ministry of Maritime, and BPR at the same time? Mm -hmm. You know, it's. Uh, I see, uh, I know I'm quite skeptical with the coordination among those three ministries, or maybe also you need to engage with other ministries. So what is your current strategy to engage with them? Thanks. Well, it's, it's only yesterday, basically, we, we are interacting with people to look at how red mechanism will uh, adopt a uh, coastal zone. And we see the challenge in terms of, I think it's mainly legal framework because it's very complicated. And I think for us as, as researchers, it's, it's better to wait and see how this thing will settle in uh, maybe while we are doing this thing, you know, part of the process. For example, um, the three miles area of, of the coast is now belongs or managed by the district government. And beyond that, up to 12 miles is managed by the provincial government. But mangrove is, you know, in some time it can be short, uh, distance can be long because of the tidal zone. So who are managing those? And the new law, number 23 this year, 2014, will abolish all this thing and everything will be handled by maybe central government again. So we, we just uh, wait and see how this thing will settle while, while engaging them in, in the research and uh, policy processes. Thank you, Daniel. John, you had a question. Can you see, please? Oh, sorry, I, I was reminded to ask everybody when they ask a question to stand up, please. Sorry, Daniel. Hi, Dan Daniel. Fantastic work. I love this project. Um, can you uh, outline maybe three outcomes, what you see are the most important outcomes of this work mm -hmm. for us? Right. I know there's been quite a few. Yeah. Well, I, I forgot to mention about the, the outreach and the role of the colleagues in the ICG, it's been fantastic when we, we work with um, media, we work with uh, those who are handling our website and blog and video. The trickle down effect of this is fantastic. So in terms of outcome, uh, what we are trying to again measure very specifically and, and watch it now is in two countries, especially in Indonesia and India. India has got 12 states which has uh, mangrove out of, I don't know, 50 or something states. 
30. So 12 states has mangrove, and uh, they've done a fantastic job in terms of surveying the, the floristic, the, the forestry kind of basic thing, but none about soil carbon. So we have a, a tremendous request to, to help them out. And uh, they have now gathered together with the leadership of the uh, uh, Forest uh, Survey India to trying to design the agenda to, to improve their understanding about, about coastal mangrove in terms of the carbon. So we, we are ready to help, but we did not promise since we, we do not know yet what would be the, the funding situation in the future. In Indonesia, it's very ob obvious about you know, uh, integrating coastal, uh, coastal carbon, mainly in, in, in mangrove, into the red uh, mechanism. Because we've, we've been uh, doing the second paper now, which is uh, being submitted in another nature, Nature Climate Change. And we were surprised to see the, the range of emission from, from mangrove, which is quite significant in terms of trying to help designing the red mechanism. Uh, it contributes about 10 to 12 percent of the national emission coming from mangrove destruction or 19% of, sorry, 10 to 12% from the national emission, 19% of the land use uh, sector. So if the reverse can be done in terms of policy, how to manage mangrove for aquaculture, et cetera, this will be a tool for red to go beyond carbon, but looking at the livelihood of fish industries and, and local livelihood, especially the coastal community. Christine, you had a comment or question. Thank you. you. You said the magic word. You said livelihoods just now. So I'd like to ask you a bit about that. You say that, um, that mangroves are sort of terrifically under-researched. I would assume that mangrove people, people who live in and around mangroves and make use of them, are also terrifically under-researched. And, they, and they're some of the most vulnerable in many mm -hmm. ways besides, you know, tidal waves sweeping over them or whatever, they also tend to be extremely poor. So I, I would just like to, that's my first question, just to ask a little bit about whether you think or whether you have built any of this into swamp up to now or what, other, what plans you might have for it. And secondly, and this is just sort of off the wall, it's just something I, I'd really like to know about with mangroves, we hear um, from you, from Lou, about how, you know, a shrimp cocktail has this incredible, co incredible co uh, cost in carbon. Um, so what happens to all those? Are there enormous areas of sort of degraded um, uh, mangroves? And what's happening with them? Is that an area that we should be working in or working with people who are around those areas? Right. Thanks. Yes, so, so far we've been concentrating to look at the carbon stock emission, etc. And most of them are in more or less pristine mangrove just to make sure we have the background information, the, the baseline. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, that uh, we are now going out to look at the adaptation aspect of it, and we are heading to degraded mangrove more and more. We work with field school that's been established by a local NGO. Uh, Sigit will be leaving next week to go to Makassar and to Tanakeke in Takalar uh, district to see uh, stream industry, shrimp farm there, and degraded mangrove. Um, we are training uh, local people how to do observation and local university, and looking at the uh, carbon stock and sea level rise. And one thing that is missing is our capacity in doing research in social aspect. So, so far we are relying on our partners who are doing this for years. And I think the, the science of it needs to be revamped. And um, again, I think we, we should start joining hand, not only ENV thing, it should be GOF. And uh, we've been invited by IUCN to, to participate in, in their bidding to look at the governance issue at uh, district, provincial level, and, and also local livelihood. I think it's, it's timely now to, to turn the tide. That's a nice pun. Uh, we still have some time for questions, so Pat Daddy. 
Thank you, Pak Daniel. It's interesting. When you said capacity building, I, I believe that you have uh, various uh, stakeholders or target beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. Which stakeholder do you think who will provide most uh, uh, different effects to the outcomes? And what kind of capacity building do you right. think that to address? While doing research, we uh, invite uh, people to, to join us uh, in the field. And of course, we provide training how to do carbon sampling, etc. And most of them are at the university. We also managed to uh, get the, the leverage of funding to, to help them establishing their laboratory. Uh, the the state-of-the-art uh, CNS analyzer is at IPB now. It's, it's not only used for us, but also used by others as well. And we, we pay, pay them when we analyze our sample. So they have the capacity in, in doing the analysis. They have the capacity of, of doing uh, field assessment. And another important aspect of capacity building is uh, with the government when we usually running workshop in two different kind of format. One is for the technical people, like how to use the protocol that we develop. And then the second session, normally two days, with the policy community to understand how important it is to know the, the wetland ecosystem in the context of IPCC, in the context of UNFCCC, because one day they have to use this uh, methodology for their reporting, their national communication. So two types of capacity building uh, to reach out the, the technical people as well as policy people. And it's always tandem, go in tandem like that. And we develop a toolbox to, to do that now which is going to be out next week in Lima. Peter. Thanks, and thanks, Daniel. Um, I'm thinking along the same lines as I do other, in other contexts, and, and I'm thinking, okay, so we're talking about mangroves as, as something to protect, and we're talking about mangroves a lot because of the destruction, and that's really important. But as you allude to, Maybe it's time to turn that tide and look at the opportunities with, with mangroves. Maybe uh, the UNFCCC should be coupled with an SDG connection with mangroves. What are the investment opportunities? What, what are the expansion opportunities of mangroves? Uh, how do we connect with the maritime focus? We mentioned that, but how do we connect it to the development opportunities of a maritime nation in Indonesia and maybe India and many other places? Mm -hmm. How do we connect it to agriculture um, productivity in the coastal area, landscape? How do we connect it to coral reef protection? How do we connect it to tourism opportunities? Right. So, mm -hmm. there, I mean, it's, it's such a focus on, on, on the coastal area. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just curious to, to hear about how, how can we, how can we um, expand our, our, our scope and perception on, on, on the opportunities with mangroves. Right. So the, the accumulation of this three-year work really is to develop a not guiding, not guideline or manual, but the principle of how to develop project. And we are going to launch that. Uh, Peter, I saw you have the, the cover page of that. In Lima, <laughs> we'll be launching the guidelines so how to develop a carbon project in the coastal zone based on the experience of various uh, small and large scale uh, project and then with that we, we try to connect the community with the global uh, realm in terms of uh, carbon market etc. That will be uh, hosted by the Indonesian pavilion on the 9th of, of uh, December. So we expect to have uh, audience who are willing to, who are keen in, in listening how to, to develop this uh, from the perspective of project. Uh, level. On the following day, we'll be hosted by the U.S. Pavilion to, to see a bigger, bigger context uh, called Blue Carbon. So we not only looking at the coastal uh, ecosystem, but go beyond that to see the seagrass and then also coral reef. So we, we have another document to launch in, in Lima uh, with CI and IUCN dealing with Blue Carbon. But when we bring this term blue carbon uh, last week in Indonesia, they um, think about, oh, it's another new term. And so we have to be careful here because people are still learning 
uh, things and you load it up with new things which might confuse. So we got the sense that this should not be pushed too far in terms of trying to push our agenda in blue carbon, but uh, trying to listen what, what they really are interested in, including the uh, local livelihood, how the local community can raise their, uh, can earn their living from the existing uh, activities. And um, not only carbon, but how can they produce fish, uh, stream in a better way. Um, and there are a number of examples in that document to be the guiding principle. That's what we try to communicate with people. Can I ask you a question, if I may? Um, as we um, come towards the, the 10th anniversary, I'm not sure that's the right word, recognizing the, the tsunami of 2004, mm -hmm. there have been a number of conflicting reports about the efficacy of mangroves as yeah. sea defenses. Um, some people say that if the mangroves had remained intact, some of the damage mm -hmm. would have been mitigated. Some say that even if the mangroves were there, the damage would have been the same. Mm -hmm. What's your view? Well, tsunami at that scale in Aceh to 10 years ago is just outrageous. I don't, I don't think any, any mangrove can, can cope with that. But uh, we, we don't expect that kind of big, kind of uh, extreme event, but uh, the gradual uh, effect of high wave and those kinds of erosion in the coastal zone are, are daily issues. So without overstating about the role of mangrove in tsunami and things like that, I think we should we should proceed with campaigning how important it is to protect the coastal zone, not only for um, the mangrove itself, but the rest of the livelihood of the community. We have time for at least one more burning question. No? Okay, well at this point, um, I'd like to thank Pat Daniel for an excellent Science at 10. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you.